Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another book discussion between the Ann Arbor District Library and the Unerased Book Club. Tonight, we will be discussing a collection of poetry called I Do Everything I'm Told. This is by Megan Fernandez. And before we get started, as usual, maybe we'll just go around and do a quick introduction with a visual description, if you're comfortable. I can start. Um, I'm Lucy. I work in the youth department at the library, so I do a lot of youth programming, but I also do a lot of book discussions, which I love. I am a white woman, 51 years old, wearing glasses with shoulder length or longer brown hair, sitting in front of a yellow wall and some books. I'm Christopher. I also work at the Ann Arbor District Library, and I do a lot of youth programming and other programming. I am wearing a checked shirt with dark glasses. I'm a white man sitting in front of a pale yellow wall with a uh, an attempted Modigliani painting behind me. Hello, I'm Amanda. I also work in the youth department alongside Christopher and Lucy. And I do adult programming, kids programming, and I like taking part in these book discussions. I'm a middle-aged white female. I have short, dark brown hair with a silver streak growing on top. I have a blue and white striped t-shirt and I'm sitting in front of a white wall with a, a print of some vegetables behind me, as well as my blender. Hello, I'm Ann. I am a book processor, primarily out of the Westgate branch. I am a mid-40s white woman, uh, heavy set, shoulder-length brown hair. I'm wearing a Kelly green t-shirt, uh, sitting in front of a white wall. And hi, everyone. I'm Sheila. I'm the founder of Unary's Book Club and co-facilitator. I am a South Asian American woman in my early 30s with longer black hair, glasses, and I'm wearing a light blue top. Uh, my background is blurred um, and we are so excited. Uh, Fatima couldn't be here today, but we're both so excited that we get to have this opportunity to talk about I Do What I'm Told by Megan Fernandez. Um, sorry, because my back, there we go. Um, I actually got mine from the library from Michigan E-Library, hence the orange sticker on top. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we're excited to talk about the set of poems. So I just want to uh, open it up and ask, what did people think of it, the collection? Um, I could start. I um, I really liked some of it. Some of it I found a, a little bit, um, I lost track a little bit of, of what was going on. It was helped when I listened to a podcast interview with her, but what I, what really struck me about this and what will stick with me is the middle part, the sonnets, that crown of sonnets, um, just how she formed that so well. And I um, just like how complicated that form is, but how well it worked. And I don't think I've ever read anything with a crown of sonnets in it. Um, so I just, and I felt myself going back to that and back to that. I think I've reread that part a lot. So that that was really my favorite part, probably. Um, well, I, I like poetry, and I like a challenge. And I know some poetry, there's um, beginner poetry or poetry that's great for people who are hardcore poetry fans who delve into it without a problem. I struggle with this book. Um, and I do like a challenge. I do like to try to figure out like the author's voice and what the poems represent individually and as a collection. And I still would just read a poem and I would tap out. Then I would read one that I enjoyed. So kind of, I was kind of all over the place with the book to me. I also did love the sonnets in the middle and I kind of fell off it after that. And then it picked up again towards the end for me. So it's kind of all over the place. So I'm really looking forward to this discussion where I can hear other voices and other thoughts and opinions who read the same collection with like this eye knowing we were going to talk about it today to kind of fill in some of the gaps I may have not picked up on when I was reading it because this book is so heavily praised and I was just like waiting to like just eat it with a spoon and I was just like kind of 
waiting and I would read some lines I liked and then it would disappear again. So I need some help today, you guys. Um, so I'm happy to hear more from everybody. <laughs> You go, Chris. There we go. I was muted for a second. I I also found this book challenging. I enjoy poetry and I wish I read more of it. Uh, I One thing I like about poetry is this kind of solitary, lonely feeling because it's really just a writer describing what's in his or her head and it, it often feels very lonely, which I enjoy. But I thought there was a real playfulness to this too. I also appreciated a lot of the experimental choices. I don't always perhaps get the idea that the author is trying to convey, but maybe that's totally fine. Maybe that's also part of her intent. You know, here are a bunch of words on the page, what is conjured in your mind, she may be asking. And that's fun too. But I, I'm also looking forward to maybe filling in some of the gaps of things that I, I may have missed. I hope I didn't read it too quickly. I think sometimes it's easy to just for, for your eyes or your brain to not latch on to a central point, especially when it's more stream of consciousness. And I, I fear that I may have gone too quickly through some of it, but we'll find out today. <laughs> I definitely ran into some of the same um, kind of initial, I don't wanna say struggles, but finding my mind wandering sometimes and not really grasping the, the intent behind some of the poems. Um, and it really seemed to depend on where my headspace was at any given time. Um, today, I went back through, though, and kind of skimmed and reread throughout, and I got a lot more out of the poems. They just, having read the whole thing, it all kind of connects a little bit more than I realized as I was starting. Um, yeah, and I just... Christopher, you talked about the the lonely feeling, and especially because some of these poems deal with the COVID era, that really, really comes out through those. And even the sonnets with this, like, you know, theme of bad loves throughout, it just felt, because it was a little bit more centered on the the external feeling, I don't know if that makes any sense. It it made me feel a little bit more alone when I was reading it. I don't know. I'm uh, notoriously a poor slash beginner, beginning uh, poetry reader. Um, and for the first time, I actually decided to start reading the poems aloud instead of starting in my head. Um, my audience was my child and she was very into it, um, which I was not expecting. Like she was eating breakfast. I was reading to her and she would just, if I stopped, she'd go, Mo, like more talking, please. And so it just, it would help me actually kind of get into that like liminal space between overthinking it and just taking a skimmed read of, of the poem. Um, and I found myself really enjoying the first section um, a lot. And then when I got to the sonnets, that's when I felt a little over my head in terms of structure and the technicalities around sonnets. Um, and then each sonnet has most, uh, all of the individually located sonnets have a corresponding like free form art, artistic, artistic piece to it that I didn't truly understand. I was just, I was like, okay, this is a choice. I'm going to skip it. And then I didn't realize until um, Diaspora Sonnet that she took all of the uh, artistic versions of the, the location sonnets and merged them together. And I thought that was really cool. I didn't really understand the 
foundation of that poem and like the choice to take out half those words but I really liked what it looked like at the end um and honestly I think the poems that read more like prose were easily accessible to me um the ones that were more technical or more within like the scope of what people think of as poetry were felt more inaccessible I didn't get the fact that all of those excerpts were put together. So see, <laughs> uh, learning already. <laughs> so the poem before um, Diaspora Sonnet is Wandering Sonnet. And mm. that poem is actually the first line of each of the sonnets. And then at the end or in the middle of it, uh, it reverses and kind of gives you the inverse of whatever that sentence was. So the cruelest person we love is the first becomes, um, where is it? The first person we love is just that first. Yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you. My brain, yeah, no, first. I'm not yeah, seeing yeah. it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it goes... The first sentence becomes the last, the second mm -hmm. becomes the next to last. It, it's just a really cool way of doing it. And then the diaspora sonnet, it looks like it's just that one page, but it actually continues on and they pull out words again, but all of the words are um, the I's and the U's and the we's. So it's I cast, I kill, we drag, I love, you can't. And I, I don't know the full purpose behind that, but I found it really intriguing. One thing I thought, it took me a couple of the sonnets to, I had to read a couple of the sonnets and then I didn't understand that the, the shadow poem I was calling them to the right of them were the exact words that were pulled from the sonnet. And so it took a couple of them and I was, I was kind of skimming over the shadow poem that went with them because I didn't understand. I didn't know how to read it because it's kind of like a graphic novel and I went up and down and over. Um, but after I read a couple and realized that the shadow poem put emphasis or took out words and it became a whole new poem, just pulling words from the sonnet that was on the same double page. And then that was part of why I ended up liking this section so much because it like forced me to do the work and I knew how to do the work a little bit in my own way. And I did like the part where how the sentence, the last line of one poem was the beginning of the next one. I really liked that a lot. And I like that. Um, I think I like the shadow poems even, again, that's my terminology for them. I don't know what they're called. I like those because you put, um, put emphasis on certain words. It gave them so much more weight, more of like a, a shorter poem or a poem with less words, which I just... I thought that was cool, even though I didn't really know what order to read them in still, even towards the end of the sonnet section. I, I had a lot of, I had a good time reading those ones and trying to like figure it out. Yeah, I liked, um, I think when I was reading those, I was thinking like anytime I see blackout poetry is kind of how I was thinking about it because she didn't have the actual black lines, but she just took words out. It's, I was, I always wonder like, is it about erasure in some way? I don't have an answer to that, but it's like what, you know what was why was what was taken out taken out from the poems and then I also found before I even got to the diaspora poem I was like wait are these all one poem so I just would start reading all the like shadow poems or blackout poems as one poem and it does kind of like really interestingly flow into the next one much like the sonnets are kind of that that you know, traditional form of this crown um, that ends up in that like mirrored poem at the end. So um, yeah, I just found that there was so much there when you kept returning to that and, and rediscovering what was in it. And like you, Sheila, I ended up reading a lot of this aloud and what that, I mean, of the other poems too, and what that showed me is that they, she actually uses rhyme schemes in these poems a lot but not in a traditional way they're not at the end of line breaks they're just and so it just gave me such an appreciation in general for how she plays with form and I think I would have missed that if I wasn't reading them out loud I also um, to that oh. 
I'm sorry. Go ahead, Amanda, please. I was just going to quickly say that I also enjoyed how the sonnets were so based in place. They took you somewhere else. A lot of her other poems take you all over the world too. But with this one, I really liked how the collection of sonnets in this um, second section was taking you somewhere else. I really like that. Um, so one of the, the beginning poems called Paris Poem Without Clichés was the first like ding, ding, ding. This poet like really enjoys playing with with the English form because I and mean, it feels very obvious, but every single line has at least one cliche or idiom that she then like kind of inverts or put uh, turns it on its head. And it was just super fun. Like I was just reading it aloud and it had like a lot of like synapses were firing. Um, and it's just like, it's just a really enjoyable way to introduce poetry to people who may not think of the form outside of like whatever you had to read in school and things that we've talked it was something that I know this group has talked about before with short stories as opposed to prose is like how it forces the the writer to really condense down what they're interested in for, uh, discussing or exploring and I think of poetry as an even more concentrated form of exploration and driving home a point while still maintaining this really in, a unique uh, creative integrity. I also thought she was like, there was a lot of humor in, in some of these poems. One that really stands out to me um, is that for some reason, the one where she gets the, the tattoo and she's talking about <laughs> Um, like, like just get your shit together and come home and how that tattoo can mean different things and then she, how she just really like brilliant brilliantly loses uses that line at the end towards a, a friend um so I, I was pleasantly surprised when I would like see these humorous uh little pieces popping up Lucy that was I'm looking at the page right now that was probably my favorite one in this book mm -hmm. I why it had that funniness to it and it just just resonated with me I related to it and I just I could mm -hmm. just picture her out there like in this world with this experience and also everybody needs to just get their shit together and come home I mean right so I enjoyed yeah. that one one that stood out for me was Orlando um it's on page 11, I think, if you have your book there. It was uh, just kind of reflecting on what her life might have been like had she had this child. And I thought it was great. Um, again, this was one that was probably more accessible and I think easier for an outsider to relate to. Some of her poems feel almost like she's just having a conversation with herself or with one other knowing person. And I think that makes it a little bit harder for an outside reader to um, kind of be part of that conversation. Um, but yeah, I, I liked Orlando a lot. Um, Christopher, to that point, the poem, I Do Everything I'm Told, I was listening to a podcast episode or interview with her. And that's part three of a poetry series, which we obviously, if you haven't read her other stuff, you have no idea. I didn't know. Um, and that poem is, it's basically following. Oh, sorry, not um, I do everything I told. I apologize. It is. No, no, it is. It is. I do everything I'm told. Um, where it's it's about, it's a between a chef and their partner and the breakup between the two but it's like the three different poems are different perspectives of it so this is now like an outsider's perspective I of see. that breakup okay yes yeah, so you wouldn't know that unless you either listened to an interview or you had read the other collection so yeah it is kind of like picking up the thread of a of a conversation she was having outside of what we know. She also tends to have conversations with uh, poets 
just other poets that have lived, Rilke and um, uh, Eliot, just she name checks enough other people that make me go, oh, well, I'm clearly not going to get the full meaning of this poem because I don't know the the poet or the poems that she's referring to. So I think there is definitely more to be um, gained from this book the more you actually are into poetry. I It didn't sound like she was much of a fan of visiting Venice. <laughs> Doesn't she go to uh, it's Brodsky and another poet's grave there? I didn't even know Ezra they were Pound, yeah, Pound, I, I think, right? Yeah. I didn't even know they were in Venice. Uh, but then she's also kind of making fun of herself too because she has that bug spray and she makes a joke to herself about. Oh great! Go ahead and just spray that all over these famous poets' graves, or something like that. Does that ring a bell? And it, it made me laugh. I thought it was funny. Oh, you're muted, Anne. I'm sorry. I was muted. <laughs> Sorry, I was just reading the, the line. Um, it is improper and a little funny. And I say to myself, stop spraying shit all over the poets, even this fascist one. <laughs> so she does have really great elements of humor. Um, well, like I said, it wasn't a smooth flow for me reading poems. I would like read a little bit not knowing what was being said, then a few lines would sound really awesome or then I would understand something else. I feel like for me, I would have benefited from like listening to the interviews or having like um, reading some of the poetry by some of the other referenced people, like do more of like a class study with it. Like me as a newer or more of a novice poetry reader, I feel like that I would have benefited from that where like, the words would have fallen off the page and just like stabbed me in the heart instead of just kind of falling off the page and me picking them up and trying to figure out what I'm doing with them. One poem I really, another one I really enjoyed was, um, do you sell dignity here? I like that one a lot. Like I could just picture myself or something, that one resonated with me walking into a store and just like having a day and just asking the sales clerk, do you sell dignity here? There's a video of her reading that poem live online. If you look that up, it's kind of fun to see her read that. Um, I really enjoyed the poem Masculinity, um, which at first when I was reading it, I was like, is this about how different modes of transportation can put you in can either protect you or put you in different forms of danger. And then when it got to about the two thirds part, um, I realized, oh no, this is about um, a cis couple and the man is saying like, you're always gonna be fine. And she's like, no, I really am not. Cause there's always a cost to what you think is my me being saved in the form of how masculinity presents itself. Um, and I just thought it was, it like does a good job of almost burying the lead and then the lead just rearing its ugly head right back at you. Yeah, there were, and there were some other poems where like the idea of masculinity um, came up. There was one, I can't remember where it is, but she talks about teenage boys breaking into a house and not taking anything but just doing it because they can and I was thinking about that like in compare you know pairing it with this poem just the idea of like the difference for um you know a man walking through the world and and their allowances and their um confidence and what they'll do and get away with because they're men than the difference for for women i don't remember which poem that was but um there was a couple other times where i was like oh this is this 
theme of masculinity is coming up, but I don't have those examples. <laughs> I mean, Paris Sonnet is straight up about an ex-partner who what had admitted that he, quote, I used to beat women, you tell me. Um, and mm -hmm. then goes on to say, it took me too long to realize that people who read Marx can also beat women. You are rough just once, bruised wrist, we fought on the street. Um, a child watched under a green awning. That was the era of violence. And it was over fast because you knew you were an experiment. And then it goes on for a few more lines. That's like such a stark visualization of... And because again, it's a it's a sonnet, it's time bound, it's word bound or syllable bound. Mm -hmm. Like you, it's across the like impact of violence, not just on her, but on previous partners and on even this child who's not even part of right. the relationship so quickly and effectively. It's funny when I, when I read that one, I actually didn't, now that I'm thinking about it. Yeah. But. Um, I think because I know that this this poet is a queer woman, and so I was, for some reason, I thought that was a woman partner who used to be women. But I, I mean, and and it could be either, you know. Um, but I don't know why I thought that. There's no indication. So. One thing to think about too, like um, one of the major themes in the book is is love and different forms of love, different people, different ways and different ways of sharing experiences, both the experiences and like witnessed or just what you think about love. And it's a very different look or a collection of, for me anyways, as a reader, like a book of love poems you know, because they take you all over the place, literally from the different places that she's traveling or writing from, but also just like um, informational and context wise, which I thought was pretty neat. So I think for me, I was, it was just a different experience of reading a book about a book with love poems for me. And maybe that was my, my one of my trip ups because some of them I didn't feel were directly about love or the idea yeah i think i think i was thinking about that too because i feel like i read somewhere that it was like a book of love poems or referred to somewhere but then i was thinking like about the fact that love can mean so many different things right like it doesn't have to be um you know it can be romantic love it can be platonic love it can be familial love it can be love between found family or it can be loss of love so um it, it is interesting to think about applying that like lens of love poems to to poems that wouldn't traditionally read I think as love poems maybe like reframe them a little bit it's almost a hungering for love poem mm -hmm. um, yeah. which I think especially coming out of the the um covid era kind of fits you know the the searching for connection that everybody was doing during that time one of the poems that um i enjoyed was uh, the poem Reunion. Um, and that kind of is related to what we were just talking about in that it, we always, you know, the, the cliche is absence makes the heart grow fonder. And I think we all have those people where you cannot see them for forever and get back together and be just like that. But this is talking about the other type where you are super close to somebody you don't see them for a long time and then when you do see each other it's just kind of awkward and you're not in the same place in life anymore 
That one also stuck out for me. I was waiting for a particular ending that I thought was coming. And it just was, just like you said, this awkward reunion of, huh, uh, maybe this was a, even a bad idea. You know, that was the sense I was getting from it. Yeah, if you look at the last line, I just didn't know of that poem. We make small talk against the big year of our absence from each other. Like that um, line really, you know, sums up the poem, but also like if you take that and you think about the experience that all of us have got, went through with, with the closure and, and everything shutting down, um, that's just like so very applicable and relatable and um, yeah. And a lot of people uh, veered very different directions during that year. So definitely mm -hmm. getting back together with certain people and having not much in common anymore is a not unusual story. I got the sense that she's quite a world traveler, but maybe partly based in New York City. Um, I was looking for the poem where she's on a plane having an unusual experience with another plane traveler and the, the other passenger launches into a kind of unusual story or, or, or something. Does this ring a bell? I couldn't find it. And I think the other passenger pulls out a bunch of makeup or something. I, I, yeah, I just, anyway, it sounded like such a great travel story of <laughs> I'm headed somewhere and my whole trip gets kicked off with this, this interesting meeting with someone on a plane. And I, I also really appreciated that too. I like that one as well, Christopher. I bookmarked it. It's called Sagittarius. Mm. And I like that little conversation that, that they were having and like her like reaction to this other person just sharing all of these interesting and like how they wanted to move their birthday from winter to summer. And she's oh, like, yes, you shall. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you want to be a Sagittarius? No, yes, you shall. Why not? Or they pull out the sleep mask and their makeup and <laughs> And you, it's say, a, you say, right. I used to have psychological problems, but now that's all settled, as if you've just closed a deal on a house. And I like the line break in there, too. So this one, this one had me smiling a lot. <laughs> I think unlike other poets we've read, um, Fernandez doesn't really talk too much about her family's personal histories or like the politics around her family's history. There's allusions to it. Um, like what, uh, what poem is it? Malaika, the second to last one. Um, I had to look this up, but apparently it's a very popular or well-known folk song uh, in Swahili. And that's because her parents lived in Eastern Africa. At least they grew up there. And then from there they moved um, I guess I'm assuming after Idi Amin, maybe, or like when Indians started to get kicked out of Eastern Africa. Um, that's the thing, she doesn't explicitly say it. You kind of have to figure out that there's a deeper history for her family migrating all over the place and over time and why like there's so many places mentioned, but there's no seemingly concrete idea of home. Um, which is, it's just like a huge departure from the other poets we've read who have like more specifically discussed um, like that stereotypical or like typical idea of what it means to be in diaspora, which feels means that you feel like you have a rooted home and a rooted like homeland. Um, and that there is a go between the two. It's just that go between is murky. And here everything is murky in terms of what is home. And it feels like there's more freedom then to make any new place feel like home through through poetry or through her memories. 
Yeah, I I am. Um, I only learned from something I either listened to or read with her. I think that she's like a Tanzanian and Goan descent, but also there's Portugal in there somehow. Portuguese because her last name is Portuguese. Um. Yeah. Most Goan. I mean, Goa was a colony. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Well, so that yeah, like so that a whole idea of like living somewhere or coming from somewhere or moving to somewhere because of colonization is is really interesting to think about too and then to think about where that might show up and I don't know like in the poems where she's traveling around the world you know um but so many of those places are places that were either were countries that colonized other countries you know um but it's just interesting to think about someone coming from somewhere or not coming from somewhere because of, of the way the communities are displaced, as you were saying, like Goins leaving, leaving East Africa. Why do you think there's a rabbit on the front cover? She talked about this in one of the interviews I listened to, and I can't remember exactly what she said. Oh. She's, see, the one I heard, yeah, she said was saying that the person at Tin House, Beth Steedle or whoever, just um, came up with this. And I think part of it was because Megan had really liked a collection of poetry by... Dennis Smith, maybe that had this oh called homie that has this bright yellow color on it. So there's something about the color, but then she was referencing, yeah, I don't I'm not sure why the rabbit. I don't think she picked the rabbit, but I think when she saw the rabbit, she was like, Yeah, that's good, because actually I've been seeing rabbits everywhere, or you know, it's the yeah. So I'm I'm not really sure. And that's an interesting thing to think about in general, like how much influence does a does person who wrote a book actually have over um the way the book looks you know yeah I kind of thought about rabbits and sex and I thought of like let's do it like bunny rabbits that kind of thing since I was supposed to be reading love poems again I could have made all of this up in my head I was very attracted to the cover though I love the style of it the bright this fluorescent yellow green with the polaroid I thought it was a really really smart and this is when I absolutely judged by the cover and said, yes, that looks wonderful. I want to read that. I just went through and reread the last poem, Love Poem. That's a really good poem. I like that about um, joy. And she does talk about space. Like, did she live out west and then move to the east coast? It's a good one. The truth is I am most exquisite on the East Coast, meaning I am in rhythm. I do not track the world by beauty, but joy. Yeah, I yeah, like really. the notion of um, someplace being the right place for you or it being like from reading all of these things, you see her in all of these different places is, but in this last poem she's kind of declaring that New York is home like that's where she feels like who she is I liked how that poem like I really like that poem too and she's ending on this note of joy and how it is like bookended with the first poem where she's talking about being tired of of love poems I thought that was like a really interesting way to um sort of put you know a beginning and an end on um on this collection of poetry. We also wondered if she was asking us about the book. Like, yes, it was joy, wasn't it? Even if it was ugly, it was joy. Like you could say that about so many experiences. I like that interpretation where she's checking, not checking in, but she's opening it up to the reader. Uh, that's cool. Yeah, I like that too. You know, it's interesting. Like, we came into this conversation, many of us being like, all of us saying, like, we liked it, but parts felt, you know, confounding or inaccessible. But then I think we've all like pulled out these lines 
from various poems where you're like, wow, that's a really great line, or that feels like it could apply to so many situations or that. So it is, it is so great to be able to have a conversation about something like this so that you can really like dissect it a little bit with the help of other brains and then, you know, kind of collectively be like, oh yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah. I had faith in Unerased Book Club that uh, <laughs> I'd have a new appreciation for this after meeting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's one of the, the joys or perks of having these discussions is reading something I may not have grabbed and then reading it and putting a critical lens on it, but also looking for that joy because I'm reading something theoretically for fun. Um, but then coming together, I always see something new. Whenever we discuss a book with this group, I always see new things and appreciate things mm -hmm. in different ways. Even if a particular read wasn't um, necessarily my favorite, or something I wasn't like specifically drawn to, I always find new appreciation. And I knew there were reasons we read this book. So I'm very happy. Um, mission accomplished on your Facebook club. <laughs> Thank you. But I feel like we're just getting really lucky this year because this is the first year that we've picked books that neither of us have read. And it's just like, oh, like I know neither. I know Fatima hadn't read this beforehand and I definitely didn't. Um, and we got super lucky that there's just really good authors who are producing mm -hmm. high quality work that allows for robust conversations and also confusion. Like Amanda, I'm really appreciative that you came into this call saying help. I don't know. Um, that made me feel less alone because I never really know about poetry. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, like us putting poetry on our list every year is my personal attempt at getting at least that practice, even if that muscle is super small, because it is a very important form of literature and one that's very often overlooked because we're given like just old poetry to work with in school. But I yeah. actually found myself really enjoying the form. And I say this every time I read poetry, I'm like, I should look into it. I never do. But I'm legitimately going to listen to more of her interviews because she's so interesting. Um, mm -hmm. And she speaks so directly and yet expansively about the way she writes and what, it, what, what she derives inspiration from or what commentary she's trying to meet make um yeah I oh no, no okay, I listen I listened to one um because I think like that's something I if I can't make sense of something I'm like well maybe sh she can tell me um but there's I listened to one I don't know if you've listened to it too Sheila called between the covers and it's tin houses yeah it's tin houses um podcast so whenever something's published by tin house this guy will interview the authors or some of them and he is so smart and well read and has like a really really unusual way of looking at things and he's not shy about saying would i be correct in like or maybe i'm totally off base but this is how i read this and so it, it, it elicits these really really interesting conversations and i thought that that one um it's long but if you feel like devoting the time it's just she's just i think you really gotta get a sense of of how um well i mean i learned about her but also like yeah her her mind is amazing and she's just knows a lot and um yeah that was one we I have listened a, to that. We have an interview with her on Wednesday. And by we, oh, I mean wow. me. So I'm feeling very, uh, not imposter but just like listening to Between the Covers and knowing how high the bar can be and how mm -hmm. um, both accessible and highbrow that interview was. <laughs> this interview is going to not be that. It's going to be a 180. <laughs> um, and... A link is very inspiring to see what a good literary interview can sound like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why I like listening to that one. But to be honest, like a lot of times I'm like, I'm not sure what he's even talking about when he's interviewing her. Um, like a lot of the words were going over my head. Yeah, she she's very intelligent. I listened to the beginning of that interview with those two. Mm -hmm. And I was doing something else at the time. It was maybe 15 minutes of it. But it just sounded very intelligent and very smart. And I could just picture them just going on and on and on and just like in a really good, like intelligent way. So I'm curious to see. I think Sheila, I think you'll have a great interview. It'll be different. Yeah. You know what I mean? It'll be it'll be awesome. Yeah. Also, she seemed very 
personable like you know the way she was talking to david i think his name is who's interviewing her um so you guys just have a great conversation um is there anything about this book we haven't touched on i really feel like we dissected quite a bit of it um is there anything that somebody wanted to bring up that we didn't talk about I am curious whether what order the poems were written in, because some of them seemed like they were written in the order that they're in the book, because it's almost like a theme that gets mentioned in one will then become the main theme of the next one. And I don't know if that was the way it was put together or if it was that was how the creative process was going. I always I wonder, wonder that when I look at a collection of poetry, like how did they decide to to put them in this order? Because if you look at like her acknowledgments, you see that some of them were published in public, like some, you know, there's more, some of them were in a American Poetry Review in 2020. And then, you know, so what is that process? I kind of pictured these like index cards with, you know, like shuffling them around to get them in the right place to tell a story. I also wonder too, with um, the four different sections, I wonder if that was part of like the placement was what overarching theme could you pull to make it be four collections versus like reading one book. I like that it was broken up for us. Mm -hmm. I get it. Um, I like that that was, there was intention behind the author's idea for that. There's always intention. I mean, to Anne's point, I'm very excited to read this again, because um, I'll probably try to reread it before the call on Wednesday. Uh, it's a surprisingly fast read for mm -hmm. poetry. Um, and now, like, hearing what you all have said about the different poems, I'm really excited to read it with that lens. And um, especially the crown sonnets, I'm going to read those aloud, because I feel like those deserve some time and space to just figure out what is the... Like there is a specific schema, but like, what does that actually sound like? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm not a Shakespeare person. Yeah, I actually looked up like crown sonnets to or crown sonnets to see what that f form was, and like it has these seven sonnets, but I think it comes out of some. Well, there's like connected to some Freudian concept or something. So yeah, it was, I mean, there's like, if you just find like a Wikipedia page, it's, it's kind of interesting to um, think about what that represents and why she chose that um, and why you don't, maybe why you don't see them a lot. Cause I can imagine that, you know, it's complicated to write. Yeah, I feel like we've had all of these great discussions, but we're somehow discussing it at like a sixth grade level based on yeah. everything that's actually in there. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's 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 a, it's the baby steps on the way to the adult conversation. Or a reframe is every no one's perfect at reading. So mm -hmm. this is an opportunity for all of us to grow. And if there are sixth right. graders watching this, I hope that you felt like we were at your level. <laughs> um, one quick thing, I was watching one of our old um, uh, the book discussions on my YouTube and I, I turned it off my computer. My husband put it, uh, turned on the TV YouTube. My daughter likes to watch some music videos before going to sleep or before taking a bath. And he accidentally clicked the resume play on the book club. And she saw me and she went, mama. <laughs> she was like, very confused. But yeah. like he let her watch it for a little bit. And so she got to see like what a book club looks like virtually. 
Well, she made a small sweet. guest, a small guest appearance one time. So yeah. She did. She did. Yeah. yeah. But um, it was just very sweet. And then I think I, I, I know I emailed Lucy about this, but I, I wanted, while we're, I'm sharing how this book club has it's shown up in unexpected places. Uh, the author of Gates, Sahar Marudi, uh, who was a poet, um, wrote, she's Afghan American. And we read that set of poetry two or three years ago. Um, mm -hmm. She emailed saying that she was looking up, she like Googled herself and saw that we talked about it here. Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah. So. I think that, I think we've done a really good job of talking about everything. I do everything I'm told by Megan Fernandez. Um, and I really want to thank everyone here for such a riveting conversation. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, and next month we're reading The, the Night Tiger by Yang Si Chu, which is a historic fiction book set in Malaysia. Yeah, I'm excited for that one. Right. Well, awesome. I hope your interview goes well on Wednesday. Thank you. We'll be looking Thank forward you. to watching it. Yeah. Thank you all for the great conversation. I needed that after reading the book one and a half times. So, <laughs> and, there's, and there's a giant bunny rabbit outside my window right now that looks like the one on the cover. I think. Love it. Have a good night, everyone. You too.